Hello, and thank you for tuning in to this presentation. My name is Matthew Nock, and I'm a professor of psychology at Harvard University. And in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about recent advances in the understanding and prediction of suicidal behavior. In this presentation, I'm going to share findings from research conducted by our research team. And so I want to start out by acknowledging those who helped conduct the research that I'm going to present. In the left column are just some of the amazing members of the Laboratory for Clinical and Developmental Research, which is our laboratory located in the Department of Psychology at Harvard University. And in the right column are just some of our amazing collaborators from around the Harvard campus and beyond, including our large consortium uh, researchers participating in the Army STAR study, as well as in the World Health Organization World Mental Health Survey Initiative. I also want to acknowledge the very generous funding sources who have supported the work I'm going to present. So before getting to any research findings, I wanted to take a step back and think about why it's important to focus on suicidal behavior. After all, this isn't something that people often like to think about or talk about. And so why is this something that uh, we spend time studying and you should spend some time um, thinking about and hearing about? Well, it's not an exaggeration to say that uh, self-injurious behavior and suicidal behavior in particular is one of the most perplexing aspects of human behavior. It's been around since the beginning of report, recorded history, and it's actually something that scholars, uh, largely philosophers, have been thinking about and writing about for the past several thousands of years. Camus has called this the one truly serious philosophical problem, and he calls it the fundamental question of all philosophy. Should we live or should we die? Should we be or should we not be? This is a deeply important philosophical problem, a deeply important human problem, and again, one that we've been thinking about for a very long time, but unfortunately, it's one that we still don't really understand very well. I can see from your face, you don't like philosophy. So think about this from a public health perspective. Data from the World Health Organization indicate that about a million people take their lives each year somewhere around the world, which means somebody dies by suicide every 40 seconds. There are about 40,000 deaths by suicide each year in the U.S., for those who are currently living in the U.S. This may seem like an arbitrary number, so to put this in context, this means there are more than five times as many suicides each year in the U.S. as HIV AIDS related deaths, and more than twice as many suicides as homicides each year in the United States. And this last fact, more suicides than homicides, is actually true globally. Each year around the world, more people die by suicide than by all wars, all genocide, all interpersonal violence combined, which if you think about it means we're each more likely to die by our own hand than we are by someone else's, which is just a staggering statistic. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of all death in the United States, third leading cause of death among adolescents and young adults, and so we and others uh, in the U.S. and around the world are especially interested in this early de developmental period and we're interested in understanding why suicidal thoughts and behaviors might increase so dramatically during this time. And unfortunately, suicide is the second leading cause of death behind accidents among college students. And so those of us working on college campuses or with um, college age friends or family members are especially interested in uh, why rates of suicide are so high during this period. For those of you working clinically, this is an important problem from a clinical perspective as well. Survey data suggests that nearly all clinical psychology graduate students see at least one suicidal patient before even finishing their training. This typically happens during internship, if not before. And unfortunately, about a quarter of psychologists and half of psychiatrists in practice will lose a patient to suicide at some point in their career. So this is just an enormous problem for us um, from a public health perspective, from a philosophical perspective, from a clinical perspective, and simply from a human perspective. It's something that we need to get better, a better understanding of moving forward. And so what I want to do is present some research um, from our group aimed at better understanding and predicting suicidal behavior. And in the time that we have, I'm going to focus on three primary questions. First, we want to get better at understanding who is at risk for suicidal behavior. We know from prior studies that suicide strikes people of all ages, all races, ethnicities, uh, sexes, socioeconomic status. And so we need to get a better understanding of which people in our society are at elevated risk so we can better uh, predict those behaviors 
and have a better chance of targeting our interventions. And so what I'd like to argue for and present data on is the use of uh, epidemiological research to get better at improving our ability to understand and predict these behaviors. We're also interested in better understanding what suicidal thoughts actually look like. As psychologists and other social and behavioral scientists, we've gotten really good at developing lab-based procedures for carefully and experimentally studying the human mind and a wide range of psychological processes. Where we've done less well, I think, is developing methods for going out into the wild and studying phenomenon, uh, phenomena of interest and really probing its properties and understanding what these um, thoughts and behaviors and psychological processes of interest really look like. And this is especially a problem with suicide and suicidal thoughts and behaviors. We can't ethically bring people into the lab and um, induce or elicit suicidal thoughts in the same way that we can say mood or anxiety. And so as a result, as suicide researchers, we really haven't observed what suicidal thoughts actually look like. However, with advances in technology, such as real-time monitoring approaches, we can now go out into the world and bring the laboratory to, to the people and get a better understanding of what suicidal thoughts and behaviors actually look like and try and move towards better predicting and preventing their occurrence. Finally, we want to better measure the suicidal mind. As any of you who have worked with suicidal uh, patients or those who um, have been in contact with suicidal or self-injurious people know, many people who are thinking about suicide or self-injury don't want to tell others about those thoughts for fear of um, other people's response or for fear of stigma or for fear of being intervened upon. And as a result, uh, we miss opportunities for detecting those at risk and again, uh, predicting or preventing self-injurious behaviors. And so what I'd like to argue for and present data on is the use of findings from psychological science to get better at, at doing just that, at detecting and predicting self-injurious and suicidal thoughts. So over the next roughly 40 minutes, I'm gonna spend uh, a couple of minutes talking about each of these three areas. And I'll start out by talking about who is at risk for suicidal behavior. So some of the most basic fundamental questions that we have on this topic are simply, what is the prevalence of suicidal ideation or suicidal thoughts, as well as suicidal plans and suicide attempts? What is the uh, prevalence of these things out in our communities? How likely can we expect to see them uh, in our clinical practice for those of you who are working clinically? We also want to understand what these thoughts and behaviors look like. What are their characteristics? When do they tend to begin? How do they change over time? And can we identify common risk factors for these outcomes? Unfortunately, although these are really basic questions, we haven't had strong answers in large part due to how we've been studying these outcomes. Most studies on this topic have been done in the West and many have been done in the East and they've been limited in, in a few ways. Most studies on this topic have collected samples of data from relatively small selective samples. For instance, and we've done these studies, we collect data from 200 middle school students in Boston or 100 psychiatric inpatients in New York or 500 college students in Texas and so on. And although this can tell us information about who is at risk for suicidal behavior, it's, it's limited in a few ways. One, we know from mortality data that the rate of suicidal death varies dramatically across the world and actually dr varies dramatically within the US. So it's unclear if data from any one region are representative of suicidal behavior more generally. So there's a problem of representativeness. There's also a problem of sample size. Even with a few hundred participants, given that suicidal behaviors are fairly low base rate behaviors, to be clear, suicide's a leading cause of death, but it's a, a fairly low base rate behavior at any given time and place and any given person. And so even if we have a few hundred people, we're only going to have enough suicidal people in that sample, in any given sample, to understand and to study this behavior in any kind of fine grained way. To do so, we need much larger samples in the thousands and beyond. And so our research team, in collaboration with other research, researchers around the world, has been um, conducting one of what we believe to be one of the largest, most representative studies of suicidal behaviors ever conducted. And what this work does is use nationally representative samples 
of participants collected in the U.S. as uh, Ron Kessler's National Comorbidity Survey. And this survey has been essentially replicated in about two dozen, two dozen countries across the Americas, in Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. So in virtually all of these countries, a nationally representative survey is done where researchers randomly select participants for household interviews. And there are a few thousand interviews done in each country. And all of these data are then sent to Harvard Medical School to the World Mental Health Survey Initiative Data Co uh, Coordination Center for coordination and analysis. And this work is done under the auspices of the World Health Organization World Mental Health Survey Initiative led by Ron Kessler and colleagues. And so far data have been collected from about two dozen countries totaling over 100,000 100, participants. And so we're using these large representative samples of data to better understand who's at risk for suicidal behavior around the world. And so what I wanna share just briefly are some preliminary findings from this effort. So our first question is, what's the prevalence of suicide ideation plans and attempts? What might you think the prevalence be? What percentage of people around the world over the age of 18 report that they've seriously considered killing themselves at some point in their life what we find is that about 9% of people, 9% of adults, report that they've seriously considered killing themselves at some point. And these data are representative of the first 17, 17 countries who had data ready for analysis at the time this uh, study was done. And in total, this represents about 85,000 participants. So 9% of people report having thought about suicide. About 3% of adults report that they have made a suicide plan, and just under 3% report that they've actually attempted to kill themselves at some point in their life. So relatively high numbers, uh, I, I think. We also see a pretty broad range. Um, so if you look to the right-hand column, you see that for suicide ideation, only about 3% of people in China, but 15% of people in New Zealand report thinking about suicide. So a very broad range uh, in the prevalence of suicide ideation. And we see similarly, similarly broad ranges for plans and attempts. Notably, New Zealand and the United States are consistently highest, with about 15% of people in those countries thinking about suicide in their lifetimes, 5% making a suicide plan, and 5% making a suicide attempt. We don't understand why this variability exists. It's, it doesn't, it's not explained by um, geographic region, uh, by developing versus developed countries, by World Bank classification of low versus medium versus high income countries. So we've looked at this in a number of different ways and haven't been able to uh, determine uh, what explains this variation. Interestingly though, although there's variability in the prevalence of these outcomes, there's great consistency in several characteristics of these behaviors. In other words, once people report, although the variation in, in um, the rate of reporting of the lifetime prevalence of suicidal ideation, there's great consistency in the age of onset of suicidal outcomes. So this figure shows the cumulative age of onset distribution for suicide ideation in each country. So on the x-axis, on the bottom axis, you see age of onset. When's the first age of onset for suicide ideation? And on the y-axis, or vertical axis, you see the increase in risk of first starting to think about suicide given each year of life. Now this graph goes to one because this is representative of all people with a lifetime history of suicide ideation. And so you can see, looking left to right, um, during childhood, virtually no one reports suicidal ideation. However, in adolescence and young adulthood, we see these rates just skyrocket for every country we examine. You can see those lines are virtually overlapping with some separation later in life. But the important thing to take from this slide is, in every country we examine, there's a huge increase in the risk of first start, starting to think about suicide during adolescence and young adulthood, with roughly half of the first onsets of suicide ideation occurring by the age 25. So we see consistency in the age of onset of suicidal ideation. We also see consistency in the conditional probability of transitioning from thought to plan and from thought to attempt. Roughly speaking, about one third of people who think about suicide ever go on to make a suicide attempt. Now that's important to know scientifically, but it's especially important to know clinically. 
So for those working clinically in the U.S., for instance, it's helpful to know that about 5% of adults make a suicide at some point in their life. It's much more useful to know that about a third of people who think about suicide will ever go on to make an attempt. So that would be more helpful to you, um, you know, if you're in the, the, um, the clinic room with a person who's thinking about suicide. We also see consistency in the speed of transitioning from thought to action, from ideation to plan, and from ideation to attempt. More specifically, uh, this figure shows the conditional cumulative speed of transition from ideation to attempt in each country with, again, um, years on the x-axis, but here we have years um, from ideation to attempt, and on the y-axis, probability of first transitioning from thought to action, from first um, ideation to first suicide attempt. And what we see is that in 60% of the cases or more, for every country we examine, the transition, transition from ideation to attempt happens within the first year after onset of ideation, suggesting that um, the first year people are thinking about suicide is the highest risk time for making a first suicide attempt. Not shown here, the longer a person goes thinking about suicide without making an attempt, the less likely they are to actually make an attempt. We also see consistency in a, a wide range of other factors for non-lethal suicidal behaviors. Although in virtually every country around the world, men are about four times as likely as women to die by suicide, in virtually every country we examine, women are at much higher uh, risk of suicide ideation, plans and attempts, as are those who are younger, those who are unmarried, which includes those who are never married, widowed, separated, or divorced. Also at elevated risk are those with the presence of mental disorders. And given this is a clinical psychology forum, I'm going to dig into that in a little bit more detail. So across all the countries we, we, across all countries we've examined, we see an elevated odds of suicide ideation, plan, and attempt. You'll see three columns here, each showing odds ratios for the, our three primary outcomes, given the presence of a prior disorder. And we looked at a number of different disorders here, about 16 total, but for ease of presentation, we break these up by disorder category. So if you look just across the first row of numbers, what's shown here is for those with any mood disorder, so depression, dysthymia, bipolar disorder, what's the increase in the odds of subsequent ideation, plan, or attempt? So if you have a mood disorder, what's the increase in odds of these outcomes? With an odds ratio of one, meaning no increase or decrease. What we see looking across the first row is that if you have a mood disorder, you've got about a four to six fold increase in the odds of thinking about suicide, making a suicide plan, or making an attempt. This perhaps isn't surprising, because if I asked you, what's the disorder that you would first think of if I mentioned the word suicide, you'd probably say depression or some kind of mood disorder. Interestingly though, if we look to the second row, you see that having any anxiety disorder is similarly associated with here about a three to four fold increase in the odds of ideation, 3.3, plan, 4.3, or attempt, 4.4. Looking down to the third row, the presence of any impulse control disorder is associated with a similarly increase in, similar increase in odds. Same with any substance disorder. Same with any disorder. And in fact, having any disorder is associated with, with odds ratios that look similar to those for mood disorder. So why is that happening? Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. If We're now looking at the midline. If you look below that midline, we also see a dose-response relationship between number of disorders and odds of suicide ideation plan and attempt. Remember, having an odds ratio of one means no increase or decrease in your odds or roughly likelihood of suicide ideation plan and attempt. And we see that for those with exactly one disorder compared to those with zero disorders, we see no increase in odds with odds ratios of 1.1, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, so no different than one. In contrast, those with exactly two disorders compared to those with zero disorders we see about a two-fold increase in the odds of each outcome. And for those with three or more disorders, we see a six to nine-fold increase in the odds of each of these outcomes. So something about comorbidity or multimorbidity seems especially important for increasing the odds of these outcomes. Why might that be? Well, a nice thing about having a sample of this size is that we can start to look in detail at the unique associations between each disorder and each part of the pathway to suicide.
And so in this series of analyses, what we did was look at each mental disorder examined, again, 16 different disorders, as well as the number of disorders in the same model to test what's the unique association between each of these disorders and the subsequent onset first of suicide ideation. And when we put all of these different disorders into a model, I'm showing here just a summary of four variables for ease of illustration. What we see is that virtually all disorders are associated with an increase in the odds of ideation. So for instance, for, for this particular anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, the presence of PTSD is associated with about a 50% increase in the odds of suicide ideation. Similar for conduct disorder, we see an 80% increase in the odds for um, alcohol abuse and dependence. The strongest increase is for depression. Perhaps not surprisingly, if a person has depression, even in the context of, of these other disorders, we see a doubling in the odds of ideation. With a sample of the size, though, we have thousands of people with ideation, we can break them out and say, among those with ideation, which disorders predict the transition to suicide attempt? And here we see depression does nothing with an odds ratio of one. Instead, it's disorders like those listed below depression, those characterized by anxiety, agitation, poor behavioral control, that predict the transition to suicide attempt. So in this model, depression is associated with increased odds of ideation, and these other disorders are the strongest predictors of which people transition from ideation to attempt. So we're seeing different risk factors for thinking about suicide from those that predict uh, the transition from ideation to attempt. And this may explain why it is that comorbidity or multimorbidity are especially important in predicting suicidal behavior. And if you're interested in more details on these findings, uh, we we've found this pattern in the U.S. in this paper in molecular psychiatry and saw a very similar pattern cross-nationally across 21 different countries um, in this paper in uh, PLOS Medicine. And a, a, in addition, a very sim similar pattern of findings in the U.S. Army um, in this more recent paper where we see depression being the strongest predictor of suicide ideation with um, the strongest predictor and the only predictor of the transition from ideation to attempts being intermittent explosive disorder. So a very similar pattern of findings across many different samples. So what this means clinically is um, we, we should look out for disorders like um, depression as well as a range of other disorders for predicting ideation, but should be especially cognizant of factors uh, su such as anxiety, agitation, poor behavioral control, and looking to predict which people are going to go on to make a suicide attempt. Now, concern about these earlier, potential concern about these earlier findings are that they are based on long-term retrospective self-report with adults. So we're asking people in adulthood to report back on their first onset of ideation and plans and attempts, which is often happening around adolescence. So we did, we did some follow-up work looking at the National Comorbidity Survey Adolescent Supplement, which is a nationally representative sample of about 10,000 U.S. adolescents, to see if we look closer in time, what do we see? And we see a very similar pattern of findings where we see no suicidal outcomes during childhood, and then during adolescence, we see just a skyrocketing of suicide ideation plans and attempts. In terms of disorders, um, in terms of risk factors, we see a very similar pattern to what we see in adults, um, replicating or confirming the findings that I just presented. And in terms of treatment for adolescents, we see a little bit of a, a, a glass half empty, glass half full picture. We see that about half to two thirds of suicidal adolescents report receiving treatment prior to their first onset of suicidal thoughts, plans, and attempts, which is good. One might see this as a, a, a signal that we need to get better at, in terms of treatment, given that a, a large percentage of, of adolescents in treatment are still going on to think about suicide. Granted, these findings can't say anything about the effectiveness of treatment, just that um, overall adolescents or parents or clinicians are doing a fairly good job at um, getting those at risk into treatment. In this series of um, papers conducted by the World Health Organization World Mental Health Survey Initiative, we looked at a range of different uh, other potential risk and protective factors, such as um, adverse life events, chronic medical conditions, family history of psychopathology. We've examined protective factors, um, treatment utilization, and barriers to treatment. I have, don't have time here to talk about additional findings, but if you're interested, I would strongly encourage you to check out those uh, those findings. So. The findings I've, I've described so far are focused on um, identifying risk factors. A, an important question clinically is, what can we do with these risk factors in terms of improving our ability to predict suicide attempts? And so we've begun to do some predictive modeling of suicide attempts. Um, in early work done by um, Guy Borges and colleagues, what we did was uh, create a risk index 
for 12 months suicide attempt among those with ideation. So again, we're trying to predict of those who have suicide ideation, can we predict who's going to make an attempt in the next 12 months? A really important question clinically. And so this is a study done with the National Comorbidity Survey replication sample, so a little over 5,000 uh, representative U.S. Uh, adults. And what we did was create a risk index using our strongest risk factors among those I just presented. And roughly speaking, we added up the risk factors. So we overweighted suicide attempt, given that's a really strong risk factor for uh, uh, future attempts. And then for the other 11 risk factors, we simply added them up. And we added them up to put people in one of four different groups. So those with, roughly speaking, zero to three risk factors were considered to be very low risk, four to six risk factors low, and so on and so forth. And what we find is that for those with very low risk, based on this additive model, this very low risk group represents 19% of the total sample, and none of them made a suicide attempt over the next year. The low risk group represented about half the sample, 3% of them made a suicide attempt. The intermediate group was 16% of the sample, 21% made a suicide attempt, the high-risk group is only 13% of the sample, 78% of whom made a suicide attempt over the next 12 months, and this represented about two-thirds of all suicide attempts. And what this suggests is, although it's a very crude approach, just by adding up our risk factors, we can do a pretty good job of identifying a, a, a group where we see a high concentration of risk. This general approach has been used and uh, we found that we can basically replicate these findings looking at data from 21 different countries around the world with a sample of over 100,000 people uh, with a fair degree of accuracy um, with area under the receiving operating curve here of 0.74 to 0.8. And we're further developing this concentration of risk approach um, in different settings using uh, more recent and uh, more rigorous uh, modeling approaches such as machine learning approaches. And if you're interested, I would definitely encourage you to check out this recent paper by Ron Kester and colleagues uh, in which the researchers examined a sample of um, army soldiers at high risk and using just administrative data that were available identified a, a, a high concentration of risk and in fact the top 5% of people identified to be the people identified to be at the highest level of risk the top type 5% represented 50% of the people who died by suicide over the next year so there's still a lot of false positive here but we're finding that we can um, get higher, more, more and more enriched samples. And you can think about this as, if we're looking for, for suicide attempts or suicide, prospect of suicide deaths as needles in a haystack, we can, using these approaches, start to get smaller and smaller haystacks that have higher and higher concentrations of needles. Um, and so it's still a far way to go, but so far some, some uh, very encouraging findings. I wanted to transition now to talk about what suicidal thoughts actually look like, and the, with the idea of using real-time monitoring to improve our understanding. And so a big limitation in this area is that we know clinically that suicidal thoughts or self-injurious thoughts and behaviors more generally are transient in nature. They tend to come and go and they're rarely present during our clinical or research assessments. So as a result, prior assessment methods have to rely on long-term retrospective aggregate self-reports such as those I've just described. We ask people, how many times in your life have you thought of suicide? How intense were those thoughts? What was happening at the time? We can certainly get valuable information using these approaches, but the data are fairly crude, and we don't know in real time what these thoughts and behaviors actually look like. So as a result, the basic characteristics of self-injurious thoughts and behaviors as they occur naturally simply aren't known. For instance, among those who have thoughts of self-injury, broadly defined, how frequent are these thoughts? How long do they last? In what context do they most often occur? And what predicts the transition from thought to action? We tried to study this using uh, an approach that measures the natural occurrence of self-destructive thoughts and behaviors, even more broadly defined, as I'll describe in a moment, among self-injurious adolescents and young adults using electronic diary assessments similar to uh, the smartphones that have increased uh, in availability over just the past few years. So in this study, we had several questions. First, uh, if we get a sample of adolescents who, in, who have engaged in, in recent non-suicidal self-injury, this is a group, a, a group characterized by uh, affective and behavioral control problems. If we get this group to have them come to the lab and we give them electronic diaries and ask them to go out into the world and carry them around for two weeks, our first question was, will they return with our electronic diaries? Is this even feasible? Um, what's the rate of use and compliance among an at-risk sample? If we get our electronic diaries back, uh, 
What can we learn about the characteristics of self-injurious thoughts and behaviors? How often do they occur? How intense are they? How long do they last? In what context are they mo most likely to occur? And one of our favorite questions, what predicts the transition from thought to action? And what's the function of, this be of these behaviors? Why do adolescents engage in behaviors like um, suicide attempts and non-suicidal self-injury? So in this study, just, I'll run through this very briefly in the interest of time, we recruited 30 adolescents from local clinics in the community who had a recent history of non-suicidal self-injury, and you see their characteristics here. And procedurally, we brought these adolescents into our lab with an adult, with a parent or guardian if they were under the age of 18, and trained them in a brief session in how to use the electronic diary. And we provided them with a manual uh, that reminded them how to uh, complete these diary assessments. They were prompted to complete a diary twice a day for 14 days and also asked to self-initiate an entry if they had any self-destructive thought or behavior. They were asked to upload data to a, a secure server each day. This is before uh, the days of Wi-Fi, which amazingly has just happened in the past few years, but when we conducted this study, adolescents had to upload data to a secure server through a hardwire connection either at their home or school or library or someone else. And we had safety procedures in place to monitor these data very closely to make sure that no one was at imminent risk for serious harm or death. I want to show you briefly what these diaries look like. So they, these weren't Dear Diary, How Was Your Day kind of diaries. Instead, they were largely checkbox questions. And we had two different diaries. One was a nighttime log that adolescents uh, as advertised completed at the end of each day that reported on how was their day overall, how was their mood overall, how was their sleeping, and so on. We also had an event log that they completed much more frequently, and those are the ones I'm going to present data from. The event logs asked about, did you have any self-destructive thoughts? We asked about thoughts of suicide and self-injury, as well as a range of other potentially self-destructive behaviors like use of alcohol and drugs and binging and purging and so on. The reason being, we think that suicide and self-injury and these other self-destructive behaviors might represent different forms of behavior that serve the same function, such as to escape from aversive thoughts or feelings. And so we wanted to test the extent to which these, these thoughts and behaviors co-occur. So we measured this broad range of self-destructive thoughts. If you had the thought, you were then asked, what are the characteristics of this thought? How intense? How long did it last? In what context did you experience it? Who were you with? What were you doing? What were you feeling? Did you engage in the behavior? If so, why? What was the function of the behavior? If not, what did you do instead? We want to know what people might be doing naturally to not engage in the behavior uh, that might be helpful for informing future treatments. And again, if you had the thought, we wanted to test what kinds of characteristics or contextual features might predict who transitions from thought to action. So in terms of results, I'm happy to say that all of our diaries came back and we had fairly good compliance. We asked people to complete two entries per day and most adolescents did that. I should note that we gave a bonus uh, compensation for 80% compliance. And at the end of the study, we had over 1,200 observations or entries, about 40 entries per person, so about three per day. So fairly good compliance uh, and fairly dense data. Here's a list of the, the, the count of different thoughts and behaviors that we captured. And I'm going to focus here on presenting the non-suicidal self-injury, self-injurious thoughts and behaviors. And the suicidal thoughts, we didn't have any suicide, suicidal behaviors or suicide attempts over this period. So I'll be focusing on self-injurious and suicidal thoughts and then self-injurious behaviors. And we can see already, interestingly, you'll recall about a third of the time that people think about suicide, or a third of people who think about suicide make a transition to attempt. Here, during about a third of self-injurious thoughts, people make a transition to self-injurious behavior. So in terms of frequency, here's who had these thoughts, what percentage of people. Most had um, self-injurious thoughts, not surprisingly, because we recruited this group for history of non-suicidal self-injury. And we see that, looking at the bottom row, for self-injurious thoughts, people had about one per day. For suicidal thoughts, people had about one per week. So self-injurious thoughts occur much more frequently than suicidal thoughts. Interestingly, we saw that if you had a self-injurious thought, a thought of non-suicidal self-injury, this first column, about 15 to 20% of the time that these thoughts occurred, 
Adolescents also, at the same time, reported thoughts of drug use, alcohol use, binging, and purging, suggesting that many of these thoughts of different behaviors tend to co-occur, so maybe they might represent different forms of behavior that serve the same function. And we see a similar pattern for suicidal thoughts as well. And if you look in the footnote here, we see that the, the co-occurrence of these other self-destructive thoughts did not predict transition to self-injurious behavior. In terms of severity of thought or intensity of thought for self-injury, these thoughts were of moderate intensity most often with a, a, a fair range, but going towards more severe. If you look at the last column, the thoughts were also of moderate intensity, but going more toward mild. mild. So self-injurious thoughts tend to be overall more severe than suicidal thoughts. And for self-injury thoughts, looking at the footnote, perhaps not surprisingly, greater intensity predicted uh, higher odds of engaging in self-injurious behavior. In terms of duration, we see that self-injurious thoughts tended to last, uh, by and large, 30 minutes or less, whereas the opposite was true for suicidal thoughts. So self-injurious thoughts tend to be more frequent, more intense, uh, more long-lasting. And here we see that shorter duration was predictive of self-injurious behavior. And this may be because if you engage in the behavior, this leads to a cessation of the thought. What were you doing at the time? We see that adolescents were doing the things that they tend to do, socializing, resting, resting listening to music, and so on. Most interesting here, we think, is that uh, the last two rows, although drug use and alcohol use tend to co-occur with self-injurious thoughts and suicidal thoughts, it's a small minority of the time that people are using drugs or alcohol when they have thoughts of suicide or self-injury. So although we see some sort of comorbidity here, most often when, when adolescents are thinking about self-injury or suicide, they're doing it sober. And none of these um, contexts predicted su self-injury. And in terms of function, we see that the vast majority of episodes of self-injury are reported by adolescents to be for what we call automatic negative reinforcement to get rid of some aversive thought or feeling. And that is perhaps not surprising, and the, and the majority of research in this area has focused on that function. Interestingly, we see that for about a quarter of episodes, adolescents report engaging the behavior for automatic positive reinforcement, to feel something, to generate some desired internal state. We sometimes hear about people engaging in self-injury for social reinforcement, um, to influence the behavior of others, and adolescents do report that. They report social negative reinforcement and social positive reinforcement, but this is far and away the minority of episodes. These data are all based on, on self-report, shorter term self-report, but still self-report. It's really important that future studies um, identify more high risk patients or participants, such as those um, recently discharged from hospitals or still in hospitals, and trying better identify um, other markers of risk. And we and other groups are now doing this using uh, more recently developed real-time monitoring devices, such as those shown here and others. So I want to end by talking about how we might better measure the suicidal mind, and in particular, how we might use findings from psychological science to try and improve our ability to detect and predict these behaviors. Now, perhaps one of the biggest limitations in suicide science and clinical work has been that most assessment methods are limited by reliance on explicit self-report. If we wanna know if a person is thinking about self-injury or about suicide, we ask them. This is the best we have largely right now, but this approach is limited for a number of reasons. It's problematic first and foremost because many people who are thinking about self-injury or suicide in particular have a motivation to deny or conceal those thoughts. As mentioned earlier, for fear of stigma or other people's negative response or for fear of being intervened upon, for fear of being hospitalized against their wishes. I wouldn't suggest that all people who um, are not reporting self-injurious or suicidal thoughts who have them are, are, are denying or concealing. We know from the work I just presented that many of these, many times these thoughts are, are transient in nature. They may genuinely not be there when assessed, but they may return months or weeks or days or hours or even minutes later. And we also know from work in clinical psychology and other fields that many people lack conscious awareness of the factors influencing their behavior, so they may lack awareness of their current level of risk. And particularly for, for children and adolescents, they may lack the ability to accurately report on uh, their experiences. And so for a range of reasons, we know that relying on self-report is problematic. To provide some data here, 
We know that one of the highest risk times for suicide death is right after people are discharged from a psychiatric hospital. In the one week, two weeks in particular, after people leave, we see a spike in, in risk of suicide death. Now, of course, clinicians aren't letting people leave the hospital knowing that uh, the patient is, is um, intent on or considering killing themselves. Instead, what's probably happening is that patients are, are convincing clinicians and maybe even themselves that they're safe to leave. And if we rely on self-report, we may miss this high level of risk. And we currently are, we currently are missing it. We also know that the majority of patients who die by suicide while in the hospital explicitly denied suicidal thoughts and intent in their last assessment before dying. So we simply can't rely only on self-report of suicidal and self-injurious thoughts and intentions. We need methods of assessing risk that don't rely solely on self-report. So for those who think visually like I do, we have a person or we have a patient, we have a friend, a colleague in front of us who says, I don't want to kill myself. We can rely on that, but what we also want to know is, what is this person thinking that they're not telling us? What are their unspoken thoughts or what are their, their implicit cognitions? Implicit cognitions are those that don't rely on conscious introspection or explicit self-report. And this is something that we've always wanted to know. Since the beginning of, of time, we've all wanted to know what are other people thinking that they may not be telling us? What is my significant other thinking? What are my children thinking? What are my parents thinking? What is my advisor thinking? What is my patient thinking? We haven't had the ability to know uh, what's in other people's minds, so to speak, until fairly recently. So in the past few decades, cognitive and social psychologists have developed methods of measuring implicit cognition using people's behavior, using their responses to tests of reaction time or tests of memory and so on. There are many ways of doing this. One popular way of doing this is using a test called the Implicit Association Test, or IAT, developed by Tony Greenwald and colleagues uh, a, few, a few years back. This is, for those unfamiliar, a brief, about five minute, reaction time test that's usually computerized and measures the strength of association that people hold between different concepts and attributes. It's a brief categorization task. And in the interest of time, I won't go into it here, but if you are interested and unfamiliar, I would encourage you to check out Project Implicit, where you can learn about the IAT and also take IATs. And also Project Implicit Mental Health. And if you Google that, you'll find the PIMH website, and you can learn about uh, implicit cognitions, about clinical concepts, and also take clinically focused IATs focused on self-harm, on depression, on eating, and alcohol, and so on. Now, some strengths of this test are it's been shown to be reliable uh, and resistant to attempts to fake good. It's also been shown by some really elegant work by Bethany Teachman and colleagues to be sensitive to clinical change over the course of treatment. And it's been shown largely in social psychology studies to be predictive of future behavior. What we wondered is, can we use a measure of implicit associations about self-injury or death to provide a behavioral marker for risk of suicidal behavior. So I'll show a brief mock-up of the IAT for those unfamiliar, just so you understand the rest of this, uh, the, the data that I'm going to present. So in this task, a person sees two concepts, one on the left of the screen, one on the right of the screen. Here, we're, this is a self-injury IAT, so we're showing the concepts of cutting and no cutting. And you also see attributes. Some are related to me and some are not me. You'll see stimuli appear in the screen, and you'll be asked to push a, a button on the left side of the screen if it's a cutting image or a me-related word, and a button on the right side of the screen if it's a no-cutting image or a not-me word. And what we think is that people make these classifications more quickly if similarly associated words are on the same side. So if I'm somebody who engages in cutting, I should be fast responding when cutting and me are paired to the same key. So you'll see images like these. So this is an image of cut skin, so hit the left key. Left key, because this is a me-related word. Right key, because this is not cut skin. Right key, because this is a them word, which is not me. And now the task, after about 40 or so trials, and you can vary the number of trials, the task switches. So now, whereas cutting was paired with me, now it's paired with not me. And the task continues the same way. And what we expect is that 
If you're somebody who engages in cutting, you'll be faster responding when cutting and mirror paired. If you don't engage in cutting, if you're not injured, you'll be faster responding when cutting and not mirror paired. And we calculate one score for each person on this test. We calculate a D score by taking their average response latency for one block, subtracting it from the other block, and dividing by the standard deviation of all response latencies, which essentially means a positive score means that you are faster responding, or conceptually, you have a stronger association when cutting and me are paired. A negative score means you're faster responding when cutting and not me are paired. So self-injurers should have positive scores, non-injurers negative scores. In a first study, we administered this task to a sample of adolescents who engage in non-suicidal self-injury in the recent past and a matched sample of control participants and found big differences between these two groups with non-injurers having negative scores and self-injurers having positive scores. You may be saying, big deal, knock. Uh, these people told you that they did or did not engage in self-injury. Granted, but it's a slightly big deal, if I may, and that what we're trying to do here, as in many areas of, of clinical psychology and psychiatry and medicine more generally, is identify objective markers, biomarkers or behavioral markers, objective measures that can tell us who's at risk. I can see by your faces you are not impressed by these findings, neither were many reviewers. So we did a follow-up study. And here we looked at whether this same task can distinguish between those who are not suicidal, those who think about suicide, and those who have recently made a suicide attempt. And there we saw even more striking differences, with each group significantly different from the other. Now seeing these group, seeing these group differences is nice, but what we really want to know is, I mentioned earlier that we know a number of risk factors for suicide ideation and attempt, so can this test add incrementally to the prediction of suicide ideation and suicide attempt. So we did some analyses controlling for a wide range of demographic and psychiatric factors known to be associated with these outcomes. And we found that, yes, statistically speaking, performance on the IIT improves prediction of suicide ideation and attempt at baseline above and beyond these factors. What we really want to know is can we improve prediction prospectively? And so we followed these adolescents for six months and we tested with even after accounting for all these factors, does the IIT improve the prediction of suicide ideation? And it did. The big question though, the $60,000 question is, can it, can, can it improve the prediction of suicide attempts? In this first study, we had only two people who made suicide attempts in the six months after leaving the lab. So we couldn't test the incremental predictive validity of the test. We know that that one person made, was an outlier, this participant 25. That was the first person to make a suicide attempt. So this is the spread of IT scores right from our SPSS output. We had one other person make a suicide attempt. They also had a high D score. And these two were significantly different than everyone else. But again, we weren't able to um, provide a rigorous test of the predictive validity here. So we, we did a follow-up study. Uh, and in that study, we went to the place where you see more severely suicidal people and people who are more likely to make future suicide attempts. And that is people presenting to the psychiatric emergency department at a hospital. So we developed a death version or suicide version of the IIT. So same as the cutting, no cutting, but instead we use concepts of death in life with related uh, or associated stimuli appearing in the center. Put this, t put this test on a laptop, laptops, and had research assistants stationed in a local psychiatric hospital administering, administering this to as many patients as they could over the study period who came through. And what we found was that patients who came to the, the, sorry, to the psychiatric emergency room, having just made a suicide attempt, had significantly higher scores than people who are psychiatrically distressed and didn't make an attempt. And the IAT predicted suicide attempt status above and beyond all other clinical predictors we looked at. Again, the big question is, can we improve the prospective prediction? And we did. So this figure shows, uh, the first bar shows those who had uh, a negative D score over the next six months after they were seen in the ER, about 10% made a suicide attempt. For those with a positive D score, they responded more quickly when death and me were paired, paired, about a third made a suicide attempt over the next six months. And performance on this IET incrementally improved the prediction of suicide attempt above and beyond chart diagnosis, diagnosis, clinician prediction. Clinicians were no better than chance at predicting suicide attempts. Patient prediction, we asked patients themselves if they're going to make a suicide attempt. They were better than chance. 
And we also administered the Beck scale for suicide ideation to get a measure of uh, baseline ideation severity. Even after entering all these commonly used um, clinical uh, predictors, IAT improved prediction of future suicide attempts before and after these factors were put in. With decent sensitivity and pretty good specificity, we all know of the importance of replication in our field and all of science. And so uh, we've been testing whether these findings replicate. In an initial replication, we sent uh, this task along with others to our colleagues in Canada. Uh, and they did a very similar study in an emergency department in Alberta and found there as well that the, I, that the same IAT added incrementally to the prediction of self-harm at three month follow-up with a similar odds ratio and similar sensitivity and similar specificity. Finally, we're interested in testing other measures of suicide-related cognition to try and really, again, bring psychological science to bear on this really important uh, problem. And one thing that we focused on here is that the fact that many, the, the, the idea that people who are thinking about suicide, if you have suicide on your mind, you may show greater attentional bias for suicide-related information. And we want to test out whether this is the case. And we did this using a, a suicide version of the emotional Stroop task. And to provide a quick demo of what this looks like, this is pretend this is a computer screen. Uh, and you've got a keyboard with a red button and a blue button, a little red sticky and a little blue sticky. We're going to show you a series of words and ask you to indicate whether the word is red or blue. Some words are suicide related, some are neutral, some are negative. What we expect is that people who are suicidal will be slower naming the color of suicide-related words because those words will be especially salient to them. And so they will interfere with a person's ability to respond or they'll have a uh, what you might call an attentional bias toward those words. So first you see a fixation cross. We expect people who are thinking about suicide or who have just made a suicide attempt in particular to be slower naming suicide related words relative to these other words. And to not show similar interference for neutral words. We also showed negatively valence words to test whether is this effect, if it exists, suicide specific, or might it be driven by uh, the negative valence of um, suicide related word. We tested this out using a, a very similar design. We had research assistants posted in the emergency department, the psychiatric emergency department with laptops with this task programmed on it. And we compared people who came in having just made a suicide attempt to people in psychiatric distress who are non attempters. And what we're showing here are interference scores with suicide attempters in black and non-attempters in white. And the bars represent uh, interference for here, negatively valence words. So what's the average response time for negative words minus neutral words? And we see no real difference here. Effects in the slight direction as you might expect, but not different from each other at all. But for suicide related words, we see a, a great deal of interference uh, for suicide attempters, but not for psychiatrically distressed non-attempters. So we do see this interference or what one might call an attentional bias. And here too, performance on this task significantly improved the prediction of suicide attempt above and beyond all the clinical predictors that I mentioned in the previous slides. Chart diagnosis, clinician prediction, patient prediction, baseline ideation. So currently, uh, we're in the process of testing whether these effects replicate so far with positive findings for each of the studies that we've done. This is work by Christine Cha, by Cassie Glenn, by Jeff Glenn, Alex Milner, Jeremy Stewart. In each case, we've seen uh, replication of IAT um, and most recently Stroop effects. In addition, as mentioned earlier, for those who are interested, I'd strongly encourage you to check out Project Implicit Mental Health. We can learn more about uh, implicit cognition and measures thereof. Most importantly, perhaps we're examining the usefulness for um, clinical decision making. So how do we give information from these tests to clinicians uh, in a way that they can incorporate into their clinical decision making process, which is much more difficult than it might sound. We're developing and testing tests of other cognitive processes uh, that we think might be associated with suicidal behavior and beginning to develop interventions that target some of these implicit cognitions for change to see if 
breaking some of these associations or decreasing attentional bias uh, might uh, change suicidal thinking and suicidal behavior. Overall, what, what we hope to convey is that suicidal behavior is prevalent, and although base rates vary, after that, it looks pretty similar cross-nationally. Moving forward, in terms of future directions, we really need to develop predictive models uh, that can help us better identify who's at risk and prevent these behaviors before they occur. We learned through real-time monitoring that these thoughts are transient in nature and triggered, uh, I didn't talk about these slides here, these effects here, but triggered by a range of different types of uh, intensities and affective states. Moving forward, we need more studies of real-time monitoring to better understand real-time model real-time monitoring to better understand what these behaviors look like as they unfold out in the wild and what predicts imminent risk of their occurrence. We're developing some behavioral tests uh, with some early exciting findings, but there's still a really long way to go uh, and many more uh, in in innovations are needed to get better at improving the assessment and treatment of this really devastating uh, set of behavioral problems. Thank you so much for um, listening to this presentation for those who are, are still there. Um, and if you have any interest in learning more about any of the research presented, please don't hesitate um, to contact me or any other members of our research team for more information. Thanks so much for listening. Best wishes. Bye-bye.